Okay, I think um, the first thing that I, I think I need to make clear is that the reason why this encounter is actually considered to be a little bit out of the ordinary is the fact that it actually involved multiple witnesses, in fact three separate parties of witnesses in three separate cars, um, six people in all, and uh, the subsequent investigation recovered uh, a lot of ground traces in, uh, including um, marks on the field and physical marks on, on the bodies of um, four of the people involved including myself so what we have I guess is a case that's very unusual and, and, and not often encountered but Yes, you do have extraordinary evidence, which I would love to go yeah. into uh, a little bit later in the show to fill our audience in about. Um, let's start. What, when did this close encounter begin? What was the, the year? The 8th of August, 1993. Um, my husband and I were driving home from a friend's house in the Dandenong Mountains, which is um, probably about 50 kilometers out of Melbourne. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess we saw it about twice the height of the treetops um, from several hundred meters away, something that looked like a, at first like a blimp, but as we drove closer to it, it looked like a, a circle of round orange lights. Um, except in those lights, uh, there appeared to be figures standing in the shadows. Um, inside? The inside, yeah, behind the orange lights, um, you could see silhouettes of, of tall, dark figures. And I had enough time to say to my husband, look at the people in the windows when it shot off to the left of us and within in a couple of seconds it was totally gone oh um, but that was only the start of it because we continued uh, driving down the road and about two kilometers later um, we ran into what I guess you could call a wall or a screen of light it seemed that way to me anyway I actually mm -hmm. had to put my hand up to my brow hmm. um, in order to look through the window at the windscreen and I still couldn't see a thing from there on um, we actually rounded a corner and what was sitting in the field on the side of the road was um, a huge craft, uh, probably the size of a two to three storey building and mm. the length of an Olympic swimming pool. So it wasn't something that was really uh, easy to miss and we pulled the car over. But oh. We weren't the only people that did. A um, hundred metres behind us, a bank manager, his wife and their friend who's a registered nurse pulled over. and another 25 to 35 metres behind them, David, um, a government law department employee on his way home actually pulled over as well. Now you weren't travelling on the road with these people, you no, just noticed no, didn't when you know these out. people at all. Mm -hmm. yeah. all right. So basically we stopped the car, got out, crossed the road, um, I saw a whole heap of, well actually at first it, it seemed to be one figure in front of the craft and then a whole heap of them. I felt um, at the same time this energy or frequency goes through my body and it, it's quite difficult to explain it because there really isn't a parallel or comparison but mm. um, I think the only way that, that I might be able to relate it is it felt like a, uh, uh, a low level frequency mm. coming in waves through my body yet it was actually so dense that I could physically feel it and it literally terrified the living daylights out of me. I mean when I got out of the car I was um, I was exhilarated, you know. Mm. I wasn't frightened when I got out of the car. All I could think is this is absolutely amazing and we're seeing something that most people wouldn't get the chance to see in a million lifetimes. Uh -huh. And all of a sudden that euphoria changed to absolute horror. Mm. And um, I uh, really, I guess, lost the plot. <laughs> I really lost control. I, I, uh -huh. I was so freaked out I started screaming and... Mm. Um, was this physically uncomfortable to feel that wave coming through yes, you? It was almost like something was interfering with the way that my mind worked. Yeah. It was like I couldn't think straight. Um, mm -hmm. It was like I was fighting to to be able to think properly at all. And, and all I could feel was this raw emotional terror. Yes. It, was, it, it really was like a, a living nightmare. And, um, oh, goodness. Then these beings or figures came across the field, they split up in, and at the same time as I was yelling out, um, their eyes <laughs> appeared to light up a, a, a bright red colour. I don't know whether that's infrared or, or what it was, um, but of course that totally freaked me out. Um, so the screaming just got worse. Oh, no. um, they came across the field, split up into two groups. Some came towards us, some came towards a second party of people down the road. I felt this blow to my solar plexus and I landed flat on my back in the grass 
Oh, my. Um, so you got knocked over forcefully yeah. by something that didn't touch you that you saw, but it was something that... It was like, um, almost like a, an electric charge of some sort. It wasn't like a, a thump. It was like um, I'd received an electric shock straight in the solar like plexus. Like a shock, huh? Yeah. Um, and were you knocked off your feet? Yeah, literally and... off my feet and oh. flat on my back on the ground. And oh. it knocked the wind out of me. I couldn't breathe. Oh. And, I, and I really, really struggled to sit up. I kept thinking I was going to die if I didn't sit up. Hmm. Um, and when I sat up, um, I was violently nauseous as well as struggling to get a bit of air into my lungs. And um, I couldn't see a thing in front of my eyes. And that's how I remained for the the little bit that I, I remember sitting on, the, on in the grass, I was totally blind. I, I couldn't remember. Oh, how uh, terrifying. Yeah, it was actually. It was very terrifying. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think I, my, I really was hysterical. And I, uh, it's, a, it's almost a little bit embarrassing to, to think about how hysterical I was Completely. then. But I think um, it's not until you put in a situation that's totally out of your control to you. Absolutely, and you're being assaulted, knocked over, you're losing mm. your vision, and how, how and these red-eyed, terrifying foreign beings are coming towards you. That's yeah. very incredible. Anyway, uh, when I, the last thing I remember was a hand being placed on my shoulder, um, and I went absolutely ballistic, and the next thing I can remember was being back in the car. You felt something touching you? Yeah. Without, uh, so that was why you were still lying on the ground? You no, I, I was see. actually sitting up um, uh, in the grass with my, with my knees apart. Um, so I was actually in a sitting position. Um, but and the but last before, thing before I, I was touched on the sh shoulder, I heard this male voice say, well, someone do something about it. I know, no, it sounds ridiculous. No, <laughs> you know? Do something about someone her. Someone do something about her. Exactly. And you think it was one of those beings <laughs> yeah, that was... Yeah. Did you well, hear? I couldn't see. You know, I could only hear. Yeah. I was, now, was totally blind. Mm -hmm. Was this a voice you heard coming from outside? Yes, it was an audible it was, voice. It wasn't, you know... And it was clearly in English, obviously. Yes, but I, I still hmm. have trouble recalling whether there was an accent or anything. I just... I didn't recognize one, so I, mm -hmm. you know, I assumed there wasn't anything out of the ordinary with the voice at all. Did you hear any sounds coming from your husband, let's say, or the people up the road? The only, other only in the very beginning when I first got hit and I uh, sat up and, and I called out to my husband that I couldn't see that I was blind. And I heard him say, let go of me. Um, and then I heard this, the same male voice um, say, we don't mean you any harm. And my husband saying, well, why did you hit Kelly then? And um, So he saw you get knocked off your feet yeah, and gasped yeah. for air probably afterwards. Yeah. So, um, yeah, not a very good situation. I actually threw up. That's how frightened I was. I, while I was sitting down, I, I, uh, I literally threw up. So. Oh, dear. Goodness. And then the last thing you remember is being touched after uh, sitting up, and then you woke up where? Well, well, I was back in the car and totally disorientated. Um, and as far as I could remember on that particular night was us driving into this light. And I couldn't remember what had gone out on the field until several weeks later, actually, mm -hmm. until we had driven back up there again. But when I got home that night, um, the first thing was that we had about an hour and a half that we couldn't account for. It had just seemed to have gone instantaneously missing from our lives. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, I was marked with the, uh, an equilateral triangle mark underneath my navel. How large or small uh, would that about be? About nine or ten millimeters each way. Mm -hmm. And what did that look like? Uh, the triangle did it have a color texture? Yeah, it was it? red. Um, it actually looked like a, a burn, or as, mm -hmm. as if the, the first few layers of um, of skin had been removed um, mm. Mm. and I think the most well I, di I didn't pay a lot of attention to it I, I noticed it because it was geometric and I'm sort of was wondering well I wonder if this had anything to do with what we saw up in the sky but then I thought no I'm being ridiculous so I left that but I think the main problem that occurred that night was that I'd started bleeding when I wasn't due and um, quite profusely and that continued for three and a half weeks till I was hospitalized with an infection in the womb um, which the doctors, the hospital doctors had no explanation for. Now as it happens, um, the two ladies in the second party also had uh, gynecological problems, quite severe ones, mm. um, 
instantly post encounter mm. um, they were also left with the triangular marks underneath their mm. navels and what did the diagnosis for that um, bleeding turn out to be? Well, there was no diagnosis. There's even even on the medical records, I have there's still question marks beside everything. You know, they, they checked out um, a uh, well. First, they did pregnancy test to, to even test that I'd been pregnant and something hadn't festered, and that was negative. They um, they checked out endometriitis, a whole heap of things. And all that they had was that there was a uh, interuterine infection and they had real, really no explanation for why it had actually started. Mm, goodness. Um, now you wrote about all the details of your encounter um, in this book, mm -hmm. Encounter, which uh, we'll be sh talking about in a few minutes for the audience and showing them some pictures out of it. Um, but uh, so this didn't seem to be related to any uh, pregnancy or anything like that. They just have question marks. Yeah, for your case. Yeah, um, still on the medical records. Oh my goodness. <clears throat> and how did were they able to? Tr they were obviously able to treat you for this. And what was the treatment? Yeah, um, I was placed on a uh, very strong group of antibiotics um, uh, for several days in hospital. Then let out and. Um, yeah, it seemed it seemed to do the trick and and heal the problem. But uh, why the problem occurred in the first place is is still a mystery, I guess. Yeah. Anyway, I went forward to researchers. Um, this was a bit of a problem. I, I knew something had gone on here, and I wanted to do something about it. My husband wasn't in agreement with it, but I just couldn't help myself, mm -hmm. and I started ringing universities, and finally the the Civil Aviation Authority put me onto UFO researchers and. At that time, I had no idea that he, something like a UFO researcher existed, you know. I sort of thought that I'm the only person in the history of mankind that this has happened to. So uh, this was a subject you had no interest, no familiarity no, with, and this whatsoever. extraordinary experience happens to you. Yeah. And that is really what uh, made you seek out assistance from people in the field. So how did that turn? Now, what about your husband? Now, let's backtrack a tiny mm -hmm. bit, if you don't mind. Did he have any marks on his body? No, he's the only one that actually, yeah, he's the... He and, and Bill, um, the male member of the second party, seemed to be the only ones that didn't have marks on their bodies. So out of the six witnesses, uh, there were three females or four females? There was three females and three males. Uh, three females had marks and one male, uh -huh. but the other two didn't. Um, hmm. Okay. Does your husband, did he have recollection the next day also or a few weeks later when you went back to that same place? Um, my my husband, uh, he, oh, he remembered seeing the craft in the sky, and uh, but whenever I mentioned anything out on the field, he would go absolutely ballistic. He would get really, really angry, and uh, he denied it for a long time until about two and a half years ago, when he finally came out and said, you know, admitted that yeah, he he remembers what went on out in the field, and he has memories of it too, and he's also seen these things at other stages throughout his lifetime before this which really surprised me after all these years of him denying it. But you have to understand he comes from a Muslim background and everything to him was anything to do with UFOs or, or, or this was totally demonic. So his idea was not to touch it, not to think about it, not to do anything with he it. He was trying to deny this whole yeah. event occurred. Yeah, now forget what it and it'll go away. Yeah, <laughs> which obviously, as you know, doesn't yeah, work. Now, what exactly. about your background? What What is, uh, you said he was a Muslim. What? I was a <laughs> strange marriage mix here, but I was a full-on Pentecostal Christian at the time, which probably explains half of my reaction out on the field, because, you know, I thought I'd had a run in with Satan himself while I was out there and mm -hmm. I think it, you know my hysterics had a lot to do with that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think uh, having an upset reaction has a lot to do with everything. I mean, <laughs> what an incredible amount of uh, traumatic events to happen in a short period of time. Mm -hmm. So his reaction after was he didn't want to talk about it and you obviously felt the need to do so. You had had physical problems. Did these physical problems end when you came off the IV, or were there some lingering physical effects that occurred oh, no, after there, that? There were still effects after the encounter. Um, I think for about nine months I had massive migraine headaches and extreme sensitivity to light and to noise. Um, that seemed to clear up eventually, but mm -hmm. this seemed to be immediately post-encounter effects. Um, 
whether that's from, oh, I don't know what it's from, whether it's from the frequencies um, mm -hmm. we felt out. Had you field. ever had migraines prior no, to this? No, and you were never. getting them how often? Uh, on a daily basis. Some oh. days I couldn't even get out of bed. They were so severe. I, I, all I'd want to do was feel like I was going to throw up all day and I just oh. couldn't lift my head off the pillow. Goodness. And the doctors said what about these migraines? Well, not a lot. I was sent for, for CAT scans and uh, they didn't seem to be any major problem at all. Nothing um, was so showing up in the medical tents no. and they just so it was, um, sent you home. Yeah, and a few painkillers and <laughs> well, what else? It's a bit hard to tell doctors, oh, hold on, you know, I had this UFO encounter, maybe this could be linked to it. It just, uh, you know, you just don't do things like that. Right, so. right. Okay, so now um, you had started to lead us into the talk about contacting uh, researchers mm -hmm. in Australia? Yes, in Australia. Uh, Phenomena Research Australia was the people that I eventually got in contact with. And I'm very thankful that I did because um, they have now gone ahead and done what is considered to be probably the most thorough scientific investigation ever done on a UFO case in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, and who was the, the was it an organization or one individual? No, in it was an organization, but it was headed by John Orgatell. Um Although it ended up expanding beyond that, uh, uh, the Monash University of Melbourne got very deeply involved in, in the on-field data collection and analysis as well. So now, what, now this is very remarkable. Now we in this country, when there is a UFO case or a close encounter, the universities don't jump on board, and people don't start usually jumping on board to uh, do good quality research. But you had a reaction like that over there. You were very yeah, fortunate. Yeah, I was uh, very, very lucky. And uh, now, was it was this uh, were UFO phenomena? Was that commonly talked? About? About, or we no, no, actually, in Australia? Actually, oh, it's uh, definitely been research going on for many, many years. There's been a lot more cases than will ever be brought out in public, but it, it wasn't an issue that was dealt with in public at the time. So your case really was pivotal in bringing... Oh, it opened, it up, uh, opened the media up uh, in Australia incredibly. Um, yeah. yeah, it was... Uh, but the research itself, um, I just want to go back to that for a moment. Absolutely. The, the on-field ground traces and data took... Uh, 18 months of investigation. Um, there was no expense spared. There was aerial surveys, uh, you know, infrared photography from the air. Uh, the magnetic readings taken were taken by a portable magnetometer. Mm. $250,000 worth of equipment and only one of two in Australia. Wow. Um, so they basically went all the way. And I've, I've seen photographs of, of several acres of, of the field cordoned off into one meter blocks um, with pegs and ribbon and samples were taken from every single block oh, and uh, several times actually and uh, sent to two separate um, individual analysts um, but the ground traces included uh, a triangular mark out on the field that was first thought to be um, burns but ended up being the chemical pyrene which is a carcinogenic um, cancer causing agent but hmm. it does come naturally in small quantities in areas such as coal loads but geologically it shouldn't have been in this particular position and certainly not in a triangular formation. How large was the triangle, well, the triangle formation? The triangle was only um, uh, it was an equilateral triangle again uh, but the marks were only 20 feet apart um, however, there was another very large magnetic anomaly in the shape of a semicircle. And actually, if I show you the picture of the craft we all drew, um, okay. these are the this is the original craft that I actually uh, here. I'll tell you what, let's hold it up for the camera, and we'll let them uh, do a close up. Okay, we're going to use this camera, correct? Which one are we using here? All right, this camera is going to do a close up in a moment, and. Uh, there we go. All right, now I'm going to point to the one that we're talking about first. Now this one right here is the, I'm going to make sure there's no glare on it. This is the drawing that Kelly, you did. How, how long after the event, the close encounter, did you do this drawing? Um, with, within about four or five weeks. Four to five uh, weeks. Yes. Okay. Were you asked to do so? Yes, I was. When I first contacted the researchers, they, they um, asked that uh, I submit anything that I could remember, including drawings. Um, and uh, you know, uh, written documentation of everything that I remembered. The second, and, and the reason you didn't do this sooner is because you were having that medical problem for the first three and a half weeks. Certainly, oh, and that, the reason is that I hadn't gone forward to researchers. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, okay. that that took a bit of courage, and, and yeah. it also took a bit of research to even find out where to go to. Yes. But the second group came forward six weeks after okay. um, I did with the same story and drew the same thing. Yet they 
hadn't weren't aware that I'd already been to the researchers and they weren't told about that either until till approximately nine months um, after the investigation had started oh after the encounter so uh, how did these people know to come forward was there some publicity involved no none, none whatsoever they what? on their own just like you felt in no need to oh no 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 what what happened was that there was a, a an advertisement put by the researchers in a local paper because oh. I ins insisted that there was second, um, a second group of people behind me. Oh. But the advertisement was very carefully worded um, and it was basically to do if, if anyone had had any unusual acti activity in, in this particular suburb. And what they did get was a whole spate of UFO sighting reports. Wow. And then they got this one phone call of these people saying, look, I don't know if you're going to believe this, but <laughs> we had this really unusual experience. And then they mentioned the name of the road, and I mean, those sort of things weren't in So it wasn't just so. actually the people on the ground. There were a lot of people that had seen an aerial yeah, sighting of yeah. this as well. Yeah. Well, oh, I'm not is, sure if it's the same object. but um, Was it the same date uh, and the same general? Well, I don't know. I haven't got, that's the researcher's no, information. I, I, just yeah. knew, I was just told that they got so many calls and in they, for aerial sightings. Right, and they didn't say UFO sighting or anything, and yet they got a yeah. whole series of calls about this. Yeah. Very compelling so um, so basically they were kept unaware of our presence that night and um, the sketches they drew were without ever seeing mine or having any clue of what I'd drawn the same as the beings on the field they drew very similar sketches to very me. similar absolutely um, and what we'd seen wasn't the usual little gray that most people may have seen in the media these were six to seven foot tall and black Let's take a look at the drawings that um, the same witnesses, the same two women who drew the craft, yep. craft and yourself. So we'll do a close-up of this, and again, I'll point I to the. Okay, I'll point to the first one. This is the one right here that Kelly drew. And oops, cricket. Sorry about that. And the ones on the other page are by the other two witnesses who also did the same drawing, did the similar drawings of the craft, completely separate. Did these two women uh, talk with each other before they did their drawings? Were they friends? They, they, were, they were friends they in, were the in the same car. car. Yeah. Okay. Now the unusual thing is that we all did the same thing. All we drew were a face and eyes, no nose, no mouth, no anything else. And did they feel that the eyes were red as well? Um, they don't remember the eyes lighting up red simply because when they were on the side of the field, they when they first crossed the road, they saw the craft, they saw the beings, they heard a humming noise, and that was it, they were unconscious. Mm. So they didn't even see the beings come across the field and split up, they, they did see them there. Um, so our, you know, our stories slightly differ, but they, they simply because we had different experiences at, at the same place, but they did take researchers back to the same place. And, so, um, so you might have been the only unfortunate one that got knocked off her feet. Yeah, I, I might have been the only unfortunate one that managed to stay conscious for a little while uh, longer. I might have been better off if I hadn't. <laughs> yes, truly difficult one. Goodness. All right, so let's keep talking about the uh, during the investigation with this researcher. That you, did you find this helpful to find out that the other witnesses had seen a similar thing when you did? Yeah. Um, well, it's sort of uh, by that stage, I, I was really starting to think, God, I must be going crazy. You know, I mean, Absolutely. <laughs> that, yeah, it, it must, must be some form of psychosis or something mm -hmm. like that, but because it just couldn't be real. And I think that was the greatest effect on my whole life, actually, is that. All through my life I've been taught that hmm. strange things like this, they don't exist. Hmm. And uh, I believed in science and academia and, and all of a sudden, here I was faced with this reality that something did exist. And I'd been told that this just didn't exist, so I'd never contemplated it. And I started realizing, hey, these guys don't know what they're talking about. This are just opinions because they didn't really know. And hmm. uh, I think that's where your whole concept of, of, of logic and reality gets shaken to the very foundations. Um, with myself, uh, it was uh, almost like I had to go right back and start to question everything I'd ever been taught in my life um, and ask, ask myself, is this truth or not? And I have to find the answer for myself. Oh, what a difficult search. Mm. Very difficult. I bet that's been quite a difficult struggle to, uh, especially since the general public, although like I said, you're fortunate that the media and the people you turned to for help were at least willing to assist you rather than uh, giving you very negative feedback and just ignoring you to, and leaving you alone um, to deal with it. 
with yeah. that information. Well, I think I think um, the Australian media actually took to this so well simply because for the first time they had something physical to look at. They had ground traces to look at. They had marks on people's bodies. Um, uh, Glenda from the second car and David from the third car um, had amazing ligature marks around their ankles. Which, um, which implied what? Well, Glenda says that she she recalls being strapped down to a table, you know, a, 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 um, a, a relapse, I guess, of consciousness. And she said she was in a room and she was strapped down to a table. Um, don't ask me, but the ligature marks seem to say something, you know, that she was strapped down to something or something tight was around her leg. How many people had ligature marks on their Just leg? Just to her and the um, lone male in the, in the car behind her. Now, he came forward to speak with the researchers and share his experiences, but he has never wanted to come public. Yeah, um, he uh, actually didn't come pub uh, didn't we didn't even find out anything about him until 1996, three years down the track. Apparently, mm, yeah. very early on in the piece, they'd gone to other researchers to tell their story, and no one had been interested, and, and it hadn't been linked up, so no one knew that he had anything to do with this, and they'd, mm. they'd got a little bit disillusioned and decided that maybe they'd better just keep it to themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't until they saw a story in a magazine, um, an article that I'd done, that. I thought, you know, hold on a second. This sounds exactly like what, what, um, well, what he went through. This was his wife encouraging him that he's got to do something about it. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> yes, just as yeah. traumatic for the spouse uh, as the person. Yeah, and he was it. also left with um, the same marks on his body that the two women in the second car had, which a series of three dots on the inside thigh. Um, How large might these dots be? Like a puncture dot or uh, a brute, you know, like the end of a pencil eraser on the end yeah, of a pencil? Yeah, about, about the size of a, the end of a pencil eraser, um, three red spots in, in a row. That um, never faded in color. Is there any tenderness on these spots, for instance? Uh, not that I, oh, I didn't have them. That so you not, not that I'm aware of. Uh -huh. I'm, just, I'm just aware of the markings. I've, I've been given photographs of the marks. But, mm -hmm. um, now, do you still have your triangle? Nah, it went about five months afterwards. Five months. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, actually, at first it was red, and I thought, well, this could be a burn. Then it healed to be the outline of a scar, um, a triangular scar, which suggested more that it, was, it might have been a, a, a cut or, or the layers of skin removed rather mm -hmm. than rather than actually a burn. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't realize of course how important that was until mm -hmm. January the following year when the researchers said well hey you're not alone in this because the other two had it as well and uh, that was a real relief. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, so. Now, have you since you know met with the other witnesses and become no, friends, perhaps, no, no, or no, shared no. experience? I didn't understand that at first. Um, well, I thought, you know, we've been through this, and no one else in the world has experienced this. It's like, well, I really needed them because I wasn't having the support from my husband at all mm -hmm. that I needed. In fact, he was angry the whole at the whole thing because he just wanted me not to tell anybody and let's go on living the way we were living. And and yet, don't even talk about it with him. Yeah, so. yeah. Um, but they, um, at first, they, well, they weren't even told about us until July 1994, mm -hmm. so I had to wait all of that time. Um, Almost they, a year later. Mm, about nine months yeah. um, after they came forward, they were told about our presence that night. Mm -hmm. um, they hadn't seen us ahead of them, even though I'd seen them oh, behind okay. us. And um, they did go public. They did a lecture at a, at a university and two radio shows that I know of, but... I only learned of those in, in retrospect or I would have been there. <laughs> um, and they decided that they weren't going to do it anymore. Um, mm. That Bill was terrified of uh, you know, his position as a bank manager if anyone mm. found out. And uh, it was the girls who'd actually been speaking. And so they all just decided that it just wasn't worth all the, all the trouble of going public. And they decided that they were going to leave it behind. and really didn't want to deal with it anymore. There was actually a lot more to it. There was a, a big court case that went on over revealing their personal information in public and a lot of other things. Who was it that? With the researchers and the second party. Oh. So there was a, a, lot, a lot more complications that went on than, than meets the oh eye. But, um, now writing this book, Encounter, uh, which you wrote in 1996? Well, actually I didn't. Um, it was published in 96, but all of this really comes from 
um, the journals that I was encouraged to keep by the researchers. Right. It was yeah. like write everything down, you know, and may yeah. maybe one day it can be used as reference material or something. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it was it was a form of I guess a form of therapy too. But more than that, I've I've gone back through my my old um, journals, and sometimes I'm amazed at how much you forget over the years. And it's like, mm. oh God, I forgot all about that. You know, mm. it might be a little incident or, uh, you know, a little insight. And it was really good mm. to write it down. But the book basically came from that, um, and and from an interview that was done on tape. And, and what what compelled you to write this book? Was it something that felt therapeutically valuable? Did you want to share it with a larger audience? Well, um, not at first. That's why it took me quite a number of years to do anything with it. Um, I didn't really want to share it with a lot of people. It was even telling my best friends was a bit of a problem, but mm. the support that I got from them really encouraged me a lot. But it was actually researchers and other experiences. I got to meet quite a number of you know, actually now it's in the thousands of other experiences now across the globe. But by then I'd met um, several people, and um, everyone kept saying to me, "Listen, you've got, you've got the ability to actually get out there and do something. You've got physical evidence. You've got three parties of witnesses, and um, we're, we've been in our situations alone. We haven't got what you've got to get out there and tell people, hey, there's something going on." And, and basically, I think I got pushed into a little guilt trip there for a while. You're not doing your part you're yeah, that's it, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Hey, right? you've got a job to do, girl. <laughs> and, um, yeah, yeah, eventually I, I got around to doing it, and I was quite surprised at, um, you know, that a big publisher like HarperCollins snapped it up. And, um, and what kind of reaction did you get to your book? Oh, very good, actually. Um, media went uh, crazy on it in Australia, and actually that's where the a lot of... Um, a, a lot of media attention turned to UFOs from there on in, and um, well, actually a little bit before my book. Um, but I, I think I was one of the first, well, probably the first experiencer to go so full on in the Australian media, and uh, I, I was on current affairs programs and in academic journals and and so yeah. on. And yeah. you know, it's, it's it's not an easy thing. You know, I mean, I'm not an unintelligent woman, so it's a you know, I know it looks crazy, but. Yeah. Someone doesn't get up there and make a fool of themselves and invent an absolutely stupid story like that when they know how ridiculous it sounds. So the, the purpose behind that, you know, you, you know it's going to look stupid, you know it's going to probably ruin your reputation or whatever, mm -hmm. but when you've got a truth to get out there, it's really important. And um, I just thank God that a lot of people actually did listen, which is, um, yeah. yeah. You're very fortunate. It didn't ruin your reputation. And you live in a, now it did... Ruined my marriage. Ruined marriage. <laughs> I don't want to use the Jewish word, but okay, that's uh, unfortunately yeah, that's what fine. happened. Um, but you live in a small town now, yes, so in I Australia. Do. And how do your your fellow townspeople uh, feel about your experience, or is there any you know fall feedback from yeah. it? Yeah. Well, actually, uh, my next Are door my next door neighbour is a pastor of a church, and. Uh, Within weeks of me moving in, he was on my doorstep saying, uh, "I heard you wrote a book," mm -hmm. and he said, "Oh, the boys have been talking about it." So, but I don't. I, I tend to uh, stick to myself a lot. I'm a very private person, so mm -hmm. I really don't know what people say and think. I but nobody's coming. No one and will do it purposely anything. to me. Actually, yeah. the only problem, person having any problem with it at the moment is my my oldest. Uh, she's about to turn 13, and she's going through that stage where everything about her mum's embarrassing, and th this just makes it worse. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> Once upon a time, she used to be really proud of this. Not anymore. Uh, yeah, so that's, <laughs> that's just, just that age. <laughs> yes, it's being a 13-year-old. Yeah. So, <laughs> now you have three children, correct? Yes, I do. And how do the others, uh, has there been any experiences that you know of that your children have had? Or have you had, and, well, let's start with your children and then... Uh, um, well, I certainly hope not. Um, so none that you know of, no, that your none, children none. have not had any encounters or visitations. No, no. Do you feel you've had any visitations or encounters since that nine, August 93 event? Yes, I had for five months after the encounter. I had what I term as night visitations. I had woke up on four occasions to see one of these tall dark beings standing right beside my bed. Um, mm. Whether it was a sleep phenomena or something, I don't know, but it certainly seemed real when I woke up. And um, 
Yeah, uh, well, enough to scare the living daylights out of me so that, uh, you know, only, it's only been two and a half years since I've been able to sleep without the light on again. Mm. So, you know, when, you, when you've been that scared as an adult that you've got to sleep with the light on in your room, you know, it's, uh, to me it was very, very real. Um, now, the being that you saw in the follow-up visitations, mm. night visitations, were, did they appear as best as you could tell to be the same being? There's only one. Um, okay. Was it the, Did it appear to be the same as the seven out. beings? Yeah. How many did you see out in the field that night? We didn't. Seven or eight. Seven or eight. Did it yeah. appear to be the same? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yes. I mm. was um, pretty sure it was one of the same. So, other than the um, sort of teardrop-shaped head with the red eyes that appeared to mm. glow, is that a, a appropriate yeah. way to describe it? Were there? What about the rest of the features? Okay. Well, I'm sure. When it, beside my bed. Um, it seemed to be wearing a cloak. Huh. Um, like a cape? Yeah. Down to the ground? Or? Yeah, and a hood on it. And, ah. and it's really actually quite strange because um, Glinda from the second party um, only found out probably two years down the track I was given more of her diagrams and uh, where she says she came back into consciousness and she was strapped down to a table the being that she woke up and saw was also wearing a cloak. Hmm. Um, so there's a sort of a, a little coincidence there. Yeah. But out on the field, I really can't tell you about their bodies because when some, when you see this sort of this huge mass of glowing red eyes coming straight at you, you're not looking at anything else but the eyes. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, you're not mm -hmm. worried about the colour of their fingernail polish. It just doesn't <laughs> enter your mind. <laughs> Would it appear like uh, when cats' eyes, you know, the light hits them just right at night? No. Was it that kind of no. a red eye? It was like. Um, like it was like it was like street, it was it? like a, a a red hot glow on a stove, huh. that sort of glow. Very interesting. Mm. Hmm. Wow. I would be terrified. Who wouldn't be terrified seeing something like that? And I can't even imagine waking up and standing on the side of my bed as some red-eyed creature with a cloak on. That's a, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Dear. Goodness well, that, that first time it happened, there was no way I was going back to sleep that night. I was sort of absolutely I'm surprised you terrified. ever went back to sleep, Kelly. <laughs> the eye was with you. <laughs> well, at least it only uh, lasted for five months. You know, there's a lot of people uh, that I speak to. How with, often did it happen during that five months period? Four you times. Said four times during yeah. five months. And what yeah. happened during those night visitations? Okay, well, the first time um, I could feel this. I was asleep and I had a very vivid dream where I could feel this presence in my dream and something said to me not to be frightened of what was about to happen and I felt this suction on my chest and almost like my chest had turned into an elastic band and something was sucking something out of me oh. and then I got a bit panicked and it eased back into me a little bit and then it started again but really really strong and that's what woke me up like energy or something was being drawn out of me but it really made my chest feel like it was an elastic band mm. and when I woke up that's when I saw this thing standing this far away from me on the side of the bed. Yet in my dr here's the difference. In my dream, when I was asleep, I couldn't see anything. It was just a presence. Only ever in all of these dreams, when I woke up, did I see something. In the dreams, there was yeah. never anything to see. It was just an awareness of a very strong presence of something. Yeah. And what I did notice is the, the same absolute horror energy that I had out on the field yeah. was the same thing I felt when this thing showed up. Oh, dear. And... So how, what happened next when you had that feeling of horror? How long did this last? Did anything happen like a, any physical marks the next day? Any communication? Any no, missing no. time that you knew of? No, it just seemed to just stand there and look at me and, and then it was gone. But I just got the impression that I might have won this time, but you know, there'll be other days. That's that's the, the whole impression. Yeah, okay. Almost like it's, it was there long enough for me to realize that, hey, this is real. Mm -hmm. And then it, then it wasn't. And um, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't a, a good year, I think, after that. It was sort of all, and that wasn't, actually, that wasn't all that happened. I, I tend to forget a lot of things, but um, hmm. we had some very strange electrical phenomena going on around the house. Oh, um, uh, we had major appliances blowing light bulbs going all of the time. You know, what do you just, mean? Just what do you mean, going blowing up or yeah, turning yeah. on and off by itself? Um, uh, we had the TV turning on and off by itself. The, my husband's car would turn over in the driveway like it was like 
the sound of a car that's been flooded with a kill switch on and the door's locked and he'd run down to you try and find... Yeah, he'd run down to try and find the, the thief and the car's still locked and the, and the, the kill switch is still on. Oh my gosh, and, and no key in the ignition and the car is going so yeah, was, yeah, yeah, and uh, oh my. so this is some, uh, to me, and I was getting electric shocks from things that shouldn't conduct el electricity like uh, rocks and soil and wood and things out in the garden. I kept getting these, these shocks all the time and I really think that, especially with the car, that somehow whatever we were in contact with in out in the field had uh, some sort of electrical charge or something that started to well, not only affect our bodies but but you know mechanical things like the car as well so mm -hmm. it was and quite an unusual time wow yeah. how long did those strange uh, that, that stuff went on for about nine or ten months I so think, you were having so. migraines for about nine months yeah you were having strange electrical effects mm. and then they dissipated stopped abruptly well, it just seemed to disappear, it just seemed disappear. to stop. Um, mm -hmm. And so the night visitation stopped after that nine months as well? No, they, or? they were only the first five months. First five months. So yeah. after nine months after, as far as you know, you have had no experiences? Well, not, not anything like that, no. <laughs> that type of an experience. Yeah. <laughs> now, have you had any, any experiences at all prior to August 93 on the road? Well, there's only one experience that now makes sense and it didn't then. Um, in 1991 I was living in a Melbourne suburb of Laylor and I was very, very pregnant um, with my third child. <laughs> pregnant, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah very, very, very pregnant. Very, very pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, uh, and minutes away from due date. <laughs> I woke up in the morning lying spread eagled on my, my huge stomach, balancing on the bed with my arms and legs sort of off the bed, um, with my yeah. son kicking me and my waters had actually broken and I, it was really hard actually to get up off the bed and I don't even know how I got in that position but I got up and I started to walk towards the door and I noticed my night he was on the inside out and then I thought when did I, you know, just a bit stupid putting that on backwards and, and I asked myself when, you know, when did I put it on? And I could not remember going to bed. The last thing I remember was sitting out in the lounge room. And it was the first time in my life where I hadn't remembered doing something. And I sort of, you know, ticked over in my mind. And because I was going into labor at that very time, you know, sort of my, the concern about it lasted till about as far as I got to the bedroom door. And that was it. You know, the other things sort of took precedence over yes. it. But I also came up with... Um, these marks on the side of my legs which were like um, deep grooves and that were dark purple and they all seem to come up around the same time mm -hmm. and it's only now um, after I've learnt a, a lot about UFO experiences and everything that I that they that they're the classical scoop marks that a mm. lot of um, uh, UFO experiences actually have and if, if you actually feel them you can feel um, what feels like a, a hole going down through the muscle tissue right down like a punch biopsy. Mm. So you still have that mark yeah. on your ankle? Yeah, yeah, no, on both of my calves. Yeah. Both of your calves? Yeah. Oh. So oh. that does look like something else strange happened there, but... Yes. Now, can't. was the birth healthy, normal, everything went fine when you did get, you went to a hospital? Yeah, well, I had to be induced, but, um, uh, yeah, the birth was fine. Um, and your son is how old now? This is your youngest? Yeah, he's eight. And look at that big smile. <laughs> he's, he's a cutie. A, he's a cutie. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wonderful. So he's eight years old now. Mm -hmm. And is there anything unique about him that you've noticed that perhaps you think uh, is Well, his mom is a little angel. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike the 13 year old. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Bobby's little angel. And <laughs> yeah. will be again soon. <laughs> yeah, so there's nothing in particular about his health or his oh. uh, thinking, philosophy, mental capacity. Well, he's a very, very, very compassionate child, but uh, mm -hmm. whether that's got to do with the way that, you know, different children are raised, you know, you learn by your mistakes, I guess. <laughs> um, but um, otherwise. No, yeah, otherwise you see Regular every day, yeah, wonderful yeah. kid, huh? Yeah, that's it. Oh, well, wonderful. I'm glad to hear that. I mean, uh, in looking back, that's uh, very nice that everything went smoothly. Well, so this is an absolutely extraordinary case. I mean, 
the amount of evidence you have between the, the uh, landing marks and all the things that happened to the soil, um, I know that there's, I have a little list here, if you don't mind, just to summarize things for people, um, the evidence that you have. Let me get the soil effects here. Um, there's six soil effects that I got now. Where, what I'm reading off of now, just so people know, is off mm -hmm. of an article that you wrote that is on the Internet through the, let me just double check, MUFON LA website, because you were just down there doing a presentation for them as well, along with a lot of other places. <laughs> Kentucky, Canada, Northern and Southern California, and uh, the six soil effects. Now you had mentioned that there was, uh, was it tannic acid? Is that the um, Tan Tannic acid is probably the strange one because it was coat it, it should have been dissolved with all the rain. It was actually coated in, in an unidentifiable waxy substance, which seems to be a residue left from... Yeah, what's the waxy substance? That's incredible. Is it plant material or... Wax. I mean, it was. What a well, I couldn't I, I really identify it except that it was, you know, it was waxy. <laughs> so, yeah, like it it seems to be a, a residue that's... left, um, and it was only in this this crescent-shaped magnetic anomaly. In mm -hmm. fact, all of the all of the soil um, changes and, and changes in the chemistry were confined to that uh, that crescent-shaped magnetic anomaly hmm. and, and the ground within that. So, out of the entire large area that they tested, it, yeah, most of the, ev everything uh, was inside everything of was... that. Yeah. Now they're also, how is the foliage of the area? Oh, like the, that's very interesting actually. Um, all the foliage in the crescent area, including blades of grass, leaves, everything, um, was covered in a, what looked like little holes everywhere. It's like a, hmm. a constant abrasion through everything. And this little hole effect seems to go further because it was actually in the soil as well. Um, it was, the soil seemed to be fil filled with little air holes as mm. if water had been drained from it very, very rapidly, like some kind of... Um, Rapid dehydration. Yeah, exactly. That's a little bit similar to what happens uh, in some crop circles. That's very interesting. Mm. They've had that happening, the hardening of the soil, uh, yeah, the rapid... The compacting, exactly. Yeah. yeah, so the compacting from the pressure, the minute air holes. Also, there was a great deal of sulfur present in that yeah, crescent. Um, yeah, an extraordinary amount, actually, in the semicircle, sort of. But after Which my is, experience, all I could think of was a fire and brimstone. <laughs> well, the sulfur comes in really well there, doesn't it? I wonder if that's where that original association came from. You know, that's very possible. Very interesting. Now, the uh, and and the other cross reference that we have between you and the other two carloads of witnesses, a total of six people from three different vantage points. Well, the six of you were along the road. Mm -hmm. What you all share together is, um, as we saw earlier in the show, the drawings of the crafts that were all drawn separately, yet clearly, you know, are, you all saw the same thing, the drawings of the beings. Um, you and some of the other women had similar uh, medical problems after. Mm -hmm. Did any of them experience um, the migraines like you did or any unusual electrical effects around their homes? Um, I am not sure of the electrical Actually, you, you now asking me questions that I should have been asking oh. myself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now I know what to ask for. Um, <laughs> Call that research. <laughs> I, I I have been you know I am aware that they they've had um, some kind of visitations afterwards oh, they did. too. Yeah, oh, um, the ladies did. Um, as for electrical phenomena, I don't know. Bill did seem to have. Uh, there was the mail from the second party. Did seem to have one unusual um, factor with with his experience is that directly afterwards he started losing quite large clumps of hair from out the back of his head and within a very short amount of time he developed quite a large bald spot um, mm. so there seems to, I don't know whether it's effects of radiation or, or what it was but uh, mm -hmm. Now did you have any uh, uh, reaction as if you were exposed to radiation or anything like that? Well, this is this is what makes me keep thinking back to the Lalo, the the incident that might have occurred two years before was that I got very very ill after that and I started losing hair by the handful um, the same this was the right thing. after the birth of your son mm -hmm. after the event where yes, you woke yes. up and I actually had to um, oh dear I actually had a to be rushed to hospital with with what was supposed to be appendicitis and they and they did a um, uh, an emergency operation on me at one o'clock in the morning but first they did a, a t blood test and one of the signs of appendicitis is that your um, white cell count goes sky high right. and yet when they got inside all they could find was some sort of 
inflammation and there wasn't anything wrong with the, the appendix just the huh. whole inside of me had become inflamed and what I find is unusual is that radiation uh, has the same effect that it sends the white cell count soaring and mm. you know sort of all happened around the same period and it really mm. makes me think that um that you might have had some radiation exposure yeah. on the, the event that occurred before the uh, August 93 yeah. event that you talk about in this book now your book encounter is not available at the moment you have sold out of all your copies mm -hmm. and uh, people are going to just have to uh, wait while in you source. find another publisher yes. in the hopes of making it available or if they're very lucky they'll find it in a used bookstore but it's not available at the moment yeah, it hasn't been published in the United States. Yeah, now, if people, do want to, to, yeah, if people want to reach you, however, are you open to hearing from some of our viewers? Yes, here yes, the connection? How um, would people get in touch with you, Kelly? Uh, usually by email. Um, okay. Would you be willing to say your email yeah, address that's for fine. people? It's uh, all lowercase, expo, E-X-P-O, at I-O dot net dot A-U. Okay. Read it one more time. Say it one more time. Okay. That's expo, E-X-P-O, at I-O dot net dot au well thank you we really appreciate that you're willing to uh, hear from our viewers this is truly an incredible case and if people um, do want to learn more even though they may not be able to um, find your book uh, perhaps they can find more information about you on the internet anyway do you feel that there's any site in particular that might be more accurate for uh, MUFON? <laughs> Yeah, that's the one. Very good. I'm glad you feel that's responsible. <laughs> MoveOnLA.com will have uh, accurate information about Kelly Kale's uh, um, case. Her last name is C-A-H-I-L-L, -L, just so the viewers know how to spell that when they're typing it in.